really thankful for the person who um, many years ago decided to put these nice comfortable chairs in the auditorium instead of those wooden pews, aren't you? And that way you won't envy me as much in this comfortable chair. Uh, there is no way that I can sit here and preach a sermon. I would never do that for me. Unless I had to, I, I would do that. You know, It's just not my personality, I don't think. But it is comfortable. I might just stay here. This is uh, this is in uh, Rick's Rick's office, and uh, I am quite familiar with this chair because him and I have had some long talks about the ministry and our personal life, and so it's rather comfortable in more ways than one. And so that's how relationships should be, shouldn't they? And uh, this past week, uh, I got a card in the mail. It was an anonymous a donor. And uh, and they really encouraged me with some really special words, really built me up. I'm just so thankful for brothers and sisters in, in the Lord, because that's really what God gave us each other for, is uh, to love each other and lift each other up. And you never know when a person's going to need a, a word of encouragement, you know, from from another person. It's really helpful. But I wanted to tell that person uh, today uh, that I struggle too. You know, we all struggle, don't we? And uh, the flesh is so strong and the world is so uh, alive in its darkness and its persuasion and its, and its temptation you know, to us all. And so we really struggle in our Christianity, don't we? And I tell you, I, I, I struggle with Christmas every year. And uh, I really have to keep a balance because um, you know, we're, we all, we're all brought up in, in particular types of traditions and we have thoughts and feelings and emotions and experience about you know, Christmas. And I know for me, every year I have to read, get back to the Bible and read what it's saying there to bring that balance back. Uh, I like Christmas lights. I like the lights around us right now, don't you? There's, there's warmth and light. Light reminds us that God is light. But we still have to keep perspective, don't we? It's easy to, to drift off into materialism. When I look at the story of Jesus, you know, and his birth surrounding the nativity and, and, and him being born in a manger... You know, I try to take that joy, that exceeding joy that the shepherds had. I mean, the, um, they had it too, but the wise men, they were overwhelmed. And I think part of that overwhelming joy that they had when they fell down and worshipped the king was the fact that they were involved in God's plan. He put them in his plan. And, uh, and so there was, a, there was an overwhelming joy that came out probably for that reason. Then I think about the shepherds. The shepherds, you know, they were the first ones to proclaim, were allowed to proclaim heard directly from the angels, you know, what God had done. And, they, and God used them, you know, uh, to see the, the newborn child while he was still there in the, in, in the trough, in, in the manger, you know, in, in whatever he was in, uh, a rickety house or a shed or, or in a hooned out cave, wherever it was, they, they saw it. And uh, so, you know, I try to capture that, don't you? And uh, because it's easy to be distracted by the materialism or am I going to get this or that or looking forward to a a blessing from somebody. But it really is about something else, isn't it? And as we read through passages like Matthew chapter 1, I'll read it right now if you open your Bibles, uh, verses 18 through 23. And as we read through it, we see the personal things that went on with uh, Mary and Joseph. And uh, but also there's something in these verses here that God wants us not to miss so that we're not caught up in the imbalance of what Christmas can be. Notice as I read. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child with the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, translated God with us. Fathers, we open the scriptures. 
As we've just read, Lord, what Mary and Joseph went through, angels were involved. The Holy Spirit would come and Mary would have the Christ child. He would be born in human flesh. And He would walk among us and He would bless mankind in so many ways. It might have been glamorous for a moment when the angels sang and the shepherds proclaimed and the kings worshipped and put treasure before them. But for Jesus, it would only be a moment because He had to fulfill what it said right there that He came to save His people from their sins. So Father, as we come into this season to remember, may Your Word illuminate us May it powerfully change us. May it bring a balance in such a way that the trees don't give off the light, but we give off the light of Jesus Christ. This is my prayer in His holy name. Amen. Why did Jesus come? You know, why, why did He come? And uh, what did He come to do? So I think the questions we need to ask as we come to this Christmas time. Uh, did he come that we may have such classics like the Christmas Carol? I like the Christmas Carol, don't you? And uh, it's a wonderful life. It was on last night. Anybody see it? Yeah, wonderful life was on. You know, and there was that moment when he's on the bridge and he's pleading to God to give him his life back. That was the that was should be the center point. And, uh, and then they did sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, that God and man was reconciled. Of course, the whole story wasn't the focal of Jesus. And we have Frosty the Snowman and Rudolph and Elf. I can only watch portions of that. I've never seen the whole thing. But we have Santa Claus 1, 2, 3, 4. How many Santa Claus? And then they got this one where Santa Claus, they're beating each other up. Did Jesus come for that? But he did come for the classic little drummer boy, huh? Maybe that one. Charlie Brown, they sort of get it right there, don't they? Look for the true meaning. Charlie Brown doesn't have it. And uh, finally, when he goes to his psychiatrist there on the show, he figures out he's afraid of everything. But still, he realizes something's missing, and Linus comes out and he quotes from Luke, where the shepherds heard the birth story. But Jesus, did he come for us to create big pageants? Did He come that we may have nativities? Did He come that we could do all these things surrounding Christmas? Did He come so the retailers could be saved once a year? <laughs> Listen to this. 30% of all sales take place at Christmas time. 2015, $650 billion spent on Christmas. Was Jesus born to boost the economies of the modern world once a year? That's what happens. That's what we've turned it into, haven't we? So what did Jesus come for? Why did He come on that day? Why was He born? And especially a baby. But first I'm going to talk about what Jesus didn't come to do. He didn't come so we'd all get along. See, other people tried that, like John Lennon. He tried that, didn't he? Imagine. But the problem with that, one of his verses, imagine there's no heaven or hell. You can try, if you try, you can do that. And so a lot of people followed that trend. Uh, he didn't come as Henry Kissinger. How many remember him? I know I'm speaking from the older generation, but Henry Kissinger, he, tried, he wants to all get along. Did Jesus come for that? Was he born for that reason? Did he come to solve all poverty's issues? No, but he did. And the apostles with him save up money. And they had a purse. They had a treasure box that Judas was over uh, to help the poor when those moments come. Did He come for social justice? And that's a really relevant thing today that's going on in our society. And I don't want to go into it too much, but it's sort of a definition of that. It's, uh, it's misleading to social justice. Uh, the poor only need justice when something is wrong and injustice is done to them. And the Bible teaches that we should have charity and mercy when people have needs. And so uh, the view that all poor people or all minorities are victims of certain is a, is a new uh, rationale today. But it's not what Jesus taught in the Bible. We, some people want a social justice, but you can understand why they want a social Jesus or 
uh, 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 because um, they see the, the morality of Jesus. They see His moral excellence. They see that He had civic virtue and they want to follow that. But then they miss the real reason why He came and those things are good and He just cared for people and He took care of people. But He also had to send people away, didn't He? When they came for the wrong reasons. But their mistake was thinking that principally Jesus came for that reason. So that we have social justice, that we wouldn't have poor, we wouldn't have poverty. But God had sent so many before Jesus arrived here. They killed the prophets. He gave us ten moral examples to keep, and we take them away from our children and take them out of government. And so there's plenty of behavioral and plenty of stories of faith, and Jesus didn't have to focus in on that. He had to focus in on something else. Now this may sound a little strange, maybe even shocking, but if you eliminate everything that Jesus said about the poor and social justice, you would not undermine the true purpose for which he came. And this very thing is so, and you can see in John's gospel. He was that uh, apostle who was very intimate with, with Jesus. And uh, he said very, very little about the poor. As a matter of fact, when it was mentioned, it was mentioned in the context of Judas who was lying about his heart for the pure, poor because a certain amount of money was given away at this moment and he complained about that. That was in John 12 and 13. But Jesus, he did use these words in trying to help us understand the context in which he saw the plight of the poor. Matter of fact, he says in John 8 in this response to what Judas said, for you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. See, there was a principle there that you have me now. That is the important thing. You'll always have the poor with you. As a matter of fact, the poor, like the rich or like the middle class or any class, they need Jesus more than they need a full stomach, don't they? As a matter of fact, he's saying, if you'll trust me first, all these things will be added to you, poor, rich, or otherwise. In Matthew 5, on the Sermon on the Mount, he, he doesn't commend the poor here when he, when he says, you must be poor in spirit and the kingdom of heaven is yours. The idea is the poor person in spirit realizes that their spiritual poverty, of their spiritual poverty, they know that they have and they need desperately a God. That's what he's talking about when he talks about the poor there. When he gives the example of the tax collector. He was hardly a destitute man and he beat his breast asking for God's mercy. You see, he goes away justified, doesn't he? And that's the context in which he talks about the poor there. But also, um, Jesus mentions the poor when he's trying to teach about the hypocrisy of man. And a good example is that he's here in the temple, and there's 13 places where you can put your tithe in. 13 pillars in the court of Gentiles. And uh, he noticed the poor woman, and uh, she gives all that she has. Her last piece of money she gives. When he mentions all the other give out of their means, it didn't hurt them at all to give. And that's hypocrisy. Also, he talks about the hypocrites who grumbled when he went to Zacchaeus' house, the tax collector, the rich man who got rich off everybody else's money. And so they grumbled about that. But here's what Zacchaeus said. Lord, I will give half of all my possessions to the poor. To the rich young ruler, he went away sad because he had riches. Riches became his God. And Jesus said to him, sell all that you have, give to the poor, and follow me. So even when Jesus mentions them, the plight of the poor was not the focus of his teaching. But we must not conclude that he didn't care about the poor, and we shouldn't either. We know that he did. He even fed men when they were hungry. There's a proverb. God said this a long time ago. Give to the poor, you lend to God, and he will repay. And so it's always been the philosophy of God and his people to take care of the poor. But Jesus didn't come for that sole reason. He came for another purpose. He cared for the poor. As a matter of fact, we can't miss this fact right here. Jesus cared, cared for the rich and the powerful. Jesus helped anyone and everyone who came to him. Poor beggar, prostitute, wealthy tax collector, Pharisee. Nicodemus came to him. Joseph of Arimathea helped with his body to bury him, gave up his grave. And uh, they would have lost, and they probably did, they lost their clout in the Sanhedrin. 
And so Jesus cares for everybody. Matter of fact, the divide of Jesus was not the poor and the rich, but it was between the proud and the repentant. Regardless of income, social standing. So Jesus didn't come to preach a gospel uh, of social justice. He came for a greater need that we all have. He didn't come to show the works of the Christians, but the works of Christ. You see, a lot of people and a lot of organizations do a lot of things in the name of Jesus, in His name. But they leave out the most important reason why Jesus came. And that was for the salvation of every human soul. And secondly, I want to talk about what Christmas has become. And um, what Christmas is today very much has a lot to do with your, our childhood. How it began. How the culture deals with Christmas. And as I go back, you know, mine were mixed. And, uh, you know, I anticipated Christmas Eve sleigh bells and reindeers. I was listening for them. I stayed up as long as I could to see if I could catch him, Santa, you know. And uh, I anticipated the cookies and the, and the toys the next morning. And uh, my mom and my father, they were cunning. They, um, they didn't put the stuff under the Christmas tree. They put it somewhere else. Uh, they, I think they caught on that I was a little spy. And uh, they would go in the basement. But I'll tell you what my parents would do. Uh, there was really nothing up in our house until Christmas Eve and we went to bed. So we really did think St. Nick did all this stuff. We thought he was doing it. But, uh, you know, I liked, uh, you know, I mean, this, this is why I stayed up half the night. Up on the housetop, click, 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 down through the chimney came old St. Nick. And uh, how about was the night before Christmas? You like that one? <clears throat> See, it's ingrained, isn't it? You know, it's there. And it sticks with us. And, uh, and I know Paul said to grow up, you're not a child anymore. But we fight it, don't we? It's just a part, it's, it's tradition, it's inside of us. Our, our babysitter was on it. Uh, us boys would act up, you know, and uh, it was really hard to keep good babysitters, wasn't it, Mom? And with four boys, it, it, was, it was hard. But really, it was only, if it was, a, if it was a female, we were fine. But the one time she did get the mail, matter of fact, this guy was studying for the priesthood, and the first time he watched us, he said that was the last time. He didn't watch us anymore. So we were fond of the girls, but the one lady, Larita, she said, look, I'm calling the North Pole right now. She'd start dialing the phone. No, no, don't do it. Don't, don't call him. He's making a list and he's checking it twice. But you know, I never questioned the obvious because I, I like the Christmas tradition. And so we would go to my grandma's next door for Christmas Eve and I, and, and I would never question the fact that the toys were already there the night before Christmas. But presents, toys, cookies, that was Christmas. My earliest memories of Christmas as a child, you know, the psychiatrist says, you know, if it's in black and white, you were this age. If it was in color, it was this age. It was in color, so I don't, I don't know. Uh, but I was young enough, and, uh, and my mom got, and dad got me a, tra uh, uh, um, uh, a not a Jeep, not a, uh, a tank. It was a tank because it shot cannonballs. I love that. And there's a picture of me just laughing my head off because I just fired, you know, the cannonball, you know, out of the cannon. And so uh, it really stayed with me. I'm still shooting things today. And uh, see, tradition runs deep. It stays with us. And the same with tr Christmas tradition. Uh, trains, my father always had a train garden. Man, I like train gardens. And um, I couldn't, we, we have no room in our house for me to have a train garden. So I put one, I built a shelf around a room. And the train's there uh, all through the year. And uh, it's a pain to dust, but it is, feels Fills me up a little bit. But uh, Christmas stockings, you know, hung there. We didn't have a fireplace, so you hang them on the banister. You know, and I never liked to get fruit in it. It makes no sense to me. It never did. But the parents were trying to keep us from cavities, I guess. But I like to, you know, I got my first watch in my stocking. You know, that Timex, remember Timex? I don't know if they still make those or not. But uh, lights outside around the house, you know, is Christmas. But Christmas was also the birth of Jesus. Because my grandmom had that manger scene, you know, on the fireplace. And that was a real old style one, probably been around for a long time, and um, a couple chips here and there on the paint. But she always had these little angels that she made by hand that would hang around it off the mirror. And so, so Jesus, in that nativity, planted a seed here. And uh, it was mysterious, 
and it was kind of warm, it was inviting, uh, it wasn't completely understood, but over time, it took the place of all the commercialism and tradition and drove me to the cross. And so that's the center of Christmas. You know, Jesus wants to bring us back to that. And, uh, it, it, and, we have to, and we have to balance it out, don't we? And make sure that He's at the center. You know, so you know, all the celebration you know, of the angels singing and the overwhelming joy and exceeding joy we see that the, that the wise men have, uh, still something else had to take place that's written right in the Christmas story. It wasn't so easy for Jesus, was it? It's hard to perceive what He had to do to save His people from their sins. And so we, we have to look at that too. And so turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. I'm going to look at verses 4 through 10. So why did Jesus come to earth? Why did He have to come? What really happened the night He was born? Because something actually did happen according to this passage. So turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. And I'm going to start with verse 4. And listen closely. Because this is Jesus talking to God about His life. Notice what it says. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Did you hear that? It was impossible. It always rolled the sin back because the cross had to come to completely finish the work. So because of that, therefore, when He comes into the world, He says, Sacrifice and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for Me. This is Jesus talking to the Father. But He prepared a body for Him. And He came in that body, didn't He? In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scrolls of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. After saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them which are offerings according to the law, then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. And he takes away the first in order to establish the second, that would be the law, but this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. This is the most important verse in the birth of Jesus, but you'll never see it in a Christmas card. <laughs> and you'll never hear it read in a pageant about Jesus' life and about His birth. In the context of what, when Jesus speaks here, is a very uncomfortable place. Because it's where they describe the sacrifices and offerings and the brutality that took place and the blood that was shed of innocent animals were about to stop because Jesus took that on Himself. You see, we don't like to look into the manger. We don't like to look at the baby. We don't like to look at the pageantry around it and then realize that the innocence of that child now will have to suffer the brutality of a sacrifice for us. And unlike an animal, He knew everything that was going to happen, that was set before Him. No, He didn't know the feeling of it until it happened because He was in the flesh. But He had to feel it. But He was willing to do that. As a matter of fact, it seems as though He calls at that moment when He's born. When now He can realize He's in a fleshly body that now this was the purpose for which He came and He would have to face it. So for Him, it's in the back of His mind His whole life. Somebody answer that door. There is no gift greater. And you've gotten some good gifts growing up, haven't you? You've gotten some good gifts as adults. I mean, I see it on TV all the time. People pull up with a bow on their car in the morning, Christmas morning. But you can't give a better gift than Jesus Christ. You see, it's not all the charity we can bring and give to each other. It's not that. 
It's who Jesus is and what he did after he was born that made the difference, that makes Christmas the lights, the giving, the charity, the love that we share with each other. That's the gift. That's what he gave. Here's what he says. All through the narrative of the birth of Christ, as you read through it, as Christmas draws near, and you fill your own heart with the Scriptures and try to get that balance, here's what, he, here's what it says. Here's what, here's what it said right there as it read the opening Scripture. Mary says, she will, Joseph was told this by the angel, she will bear a son, you will call his name Jesus, for he'll save. He'll save his people from their sins. That's why he was born. In the field, the first night when the angels proclaimed to uh, the shepherds, it says, for today in the city of David there has been born for you Say for me, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That's the gift. So before you open the gift, think about that gift. Open that one. And really, you don't open it until it's in your heart. You don't open it until you read about it. You don't open it until you meditate on it. It doesn't motivate you and move you until you do that. Except that one gift. That's what changes everything else, doesn't it? So the Bible tells us precisely why Jesus came as we would celebrate his birth. But not to just teach love and bring us together and care for the poor, but to submit himself to an unspeakable place. Now somebody suggested this, so I wrote it down and I like it. There should be a cross hanging over every nativity scene to remind us why he was born. He was born to die for us. Jesus said this about himself. John 3, 17, God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. That's still the message. Does our world need saving? (laughs) From many things, but especially salvation. You know, the social justice thing in the name of Jesus maybe bring a lot of aid and comfort to people, but if those boxes do not bring who Christ is, we miss it. We have to get to the message. That's where the gift is, isn't it? Luke 19.10 says this, For the Son of Man has come. When did He get here? He was born born as a baby. Notice this, to seek and save that which is lost. Is Jesus still seeking today? How do you know? Well, there's some up here running their mouth right now. See, somebody's got to run their mouth. You know what? That's all of us. We all got to run our mouth. You know, this is the time of year when you bump into people more than everything else. And I'm not talking just your car, because there's a lot of more accidents in the parking lot during Christmas. There's so many of you out there. But really, we rub elbows with people more now than any other time of the year. We got to start rubbing some love off and get to know somebody, find somebody. Hook up with somebody. Connect with another lost soul. It's a good opportunity. Right now. He says, I have come to call, I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinner to repentance. Jesus was born to change lives. We've got to keep changing. In Matthew 20, 28, it says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, Notice, and give his life a ransom for many. So what's a ransom? A ransom is a a price paid to purchase a hostage or a slave. We were all hostages and slaves to sin, weren't we? So we needed a ransom. So a ransom was bought bought through a body, his body. Whose, Whose body did Jesus buy for a ransom? Ours. He paid the price. He purchased. What's the price he paid? He paid for souls by surrendering his own body. So Jesus grew up from a baby to a man. And he lived as we should have lived, obedient to the Father. When you read through John's Gospel over and over again, you just see this connection, how he so desires to please the Father and obey him. We failed there. He took care of that. And so the true celebration is not so much the works, but the salvation that he offers. We can't give a better gift. When I was, um, oh, I guess I was around 14 years old, I was um, 
working with my dad doing home improvement. And um, uh, I came home one day, and um, these two dudes were coming up the street as I was emptying my father's van. And um, uh, the one dude rips off his shirt, and he wants a piece of me. You know what that means? He, he said, you were coming on to my girlfriend. And my thought was, she said it, she did it first. But I didn't say that. I was outnumbered and he was buff. Okay? Uh, the only thing that I had possibly going for me was I had a circular saw in my hand. And, uh, but it didn't have any power to it. So all I could really do was maybe swing it. But something happened. My friend Russell came up the street. He saw I was in trouble. And he said, Take me instead. And um, uh, some of you have heard me tell stories about Russell. He's a pretty bad dude. And uh, basically when he said to those guys, it wasn't a question. <laughs> Take me instead. Uh, he took care of business. And uh, those guys never mess with me again. And uh, hopefully she wouldn't flirt anymore because her boyfriend is going to beat some dudes up. So that's what Jesus did. We were in trouble, and we knew we were in trouble. No way out. You knew, we know, we deserve God's punishment for our sins. And so when Jesus said, a body you have given for me, you prepared it for me, here I am. Father, going to take their place. Take me, is what Jesus said take me. And that brings us to our communion time, but also the decision time after our offering. Jesus said, take me. Take the penalty, I'll take it. And it hurt a lot more than what those two dudes went through who were victims of Russell, my friend. But it cost the brutal, the brutality of his own life. But in communion, as we come to that time now, a body prepared. So God and Jesus a long time ago said, we have a people to redeem. A people who need to be saved from their sins. So God prepared a body. It happened to be the one born in a manger so many years ago, 2,000 years ago. When we take the bread and when we drink the cup, it is to remind us a body was prepared, but that body had to be had to be brutalized. He was willing to do that. So we remember, he said, please remember the cost of your salvation. You know, he could have skipped the body, couldn't he? He could have even skipped it in the communion uh, uh, command. But he wanted us to remember the cost. He was God, became flesh. This, that we have that feels, that hurts, that gr it's grieved. It also has joy that now will be taken away and wiped out. And then the fruit of the vine, most precious, more precious than silver and gold, was shed, poured out. It's the only way there's forgiveness. We can't go any other path. Forgiveness came from the blood. And that's how you get rid of your sins. And that's what we remember as we take communion, that cost, that price. Father, we pray, understand, Jesus was giving thanks for his own body, for us, to be brutalized. So therefore, we thank you for the body and the bread we're about to take that represents it. And Father, we drink the cup and ask your blessing upon it. We thank you for it because it is more precious than silver. Nothing could buy our salvation but Jesus' pure, innocent blood. So would you bless as we drink, as we remember we're died for, loved, and saved. Thank you, Jesus, for rescuing us. It's in your name that I pray. Amen.